You liking it? Good stuff. Well, if it's your first time, we are going through the book of Daniel, which is a prophetic book. And I say that, but all of the books of the Bible are prophetic. And we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. But, you know, I was uh, just struck with the, the sense that when we're talking about this stuff, you know, I get excited about it, but I, I know if it's new to you, some people, what? The end of the world's coming? What? You know, and, and some people just don't get as excited about it. And so... Um, I just want to start by saying, you know, the same God that controls future events and, and uh, these things that we've been talking about in the book of Daniel and, and allows kingdoms to rise and allows kingdoms to fall, that same powerful God loves you and wants to have a relationship with you. And as I was studying this stuff today, it struck me um, as I was just kind of in my office, I turned my, my uh, iPod on and I was just listening to some old hymns. And uh, one of the songs that came on was called uh, His Eye is on the Sparrow. And it's a very, very old song, but it's a great song. And so I just wanted to share that with you tonight as we, as we get started here. We're going to be looking at chapter 2 of Daniel, not going all the way through it, but we're looking at Nebuchadnezzar's dream and, uh, and there's, this is a foundational kingpin of prophecy. But as we get started, that song, Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, my constant, uh, my constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. And so the same God that is controlling all these crazy world events that are happening, you know, 3,000 years into the future from the time they were written in. And all this stuff, he's allowing kings to rise and fall and, and all the other things. He is also watching a sparrow. He knows when a sparrow has fallen out of a tree. And uh, he knows, it says in the Bible, that he knows the numbers of the hairs on our head. And, you know, mine are getting less and less as time goes by. But the point is, that he knows you and he's watching you and he has you in the palm of his hand. And so uh, don't worry about this stuff that we're, we're talking about. Be excited about it because, again, we look forward to that time when we'll be with him. And it's really something to look forward to as we're talking about prophecy. Don't be discouraged about it. Don't be afraid of it. And, and if you are, you know, please come and talk to me. You know, set up a time. Um, I would love to talk to you about it. We actually had somebody... Scott stopped coming to the church at one point because I was talking about uh, things in the media that are pointing to the end times and that sort of thing, and, and it really frightened them to the point of, I don't want to go to that church anymore, maybe, for a little while. And, you know, that's, that's a tough thing because I, I don't want people to feel that way. If, you, if it really does strike a, a note of fear in you, um, you know, you need to address that with the Lord. And so... Um, Let's go ahead and go into it. The, uh, the first verse there, the first two verses we'll look at, um, looking at the king Nebuchadnezzar being troubled within his spirit. This is about three years into the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar. It says there the second year of his reign, but as we looked at before, the first year that they go into office really doesn't count as his first year, and so they count it as the succeeding years after the uh, Inaugura inauguration year. So, in verse 1, Now in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was so troubled that his sleep, his sleep left him. Then the king gave the command to call the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. Father, we thank you so much for your word, Lord. We ask that you would help us to understand it here tonight, Lord. We ask that you'd give us uh, the guiding of your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this dream that Nebuchadnezzar has is extremely significant in the light of Bible prophecy. Many people call it the, uh, the, the key, the major key, the great key to understanding all other Bible prophecy that is yet to be fulfilled. And so it is very important that we understand it 
It's very important that we reference to it when we're thinking of other biblical passages that deal with the end times, the, the tribulation. Many Christians go to the book of Revelation or they go to the book of Matthew chapter 24 and they look, about, look at what Jesus says about the, uh, the end times and they establish their entire understanding of when he's coming back and when the, when the millennial reign of Christ will be based on that understanding. And they don't come back to this point. And so this dream really starts off giving us a foundational understanding of all of future prophecy. And so it is very, very significant that we get a good uh, foothold on this passage. The 2,600 years span is basically what we're looking at here from the time that Nebuchadnezzar dreams this dream or really from the time that he took the children of Israel into captivity, the children of Judah from the time he took them into the captivity of Babylon, 2,600 years into the future um, at a minimum. And so, uh, very significant indeed. As we look at verse 28, if you could turn your page there, chapter 2, the dream that he dreams, Daniel goes into an explanation of what he was thinking about. Not only does Daniel give him what the dream is, He also tells him what the interpretation is, but before he tells him all that, he tells him, here's what you were thinking about before you went to bed that night. And so it's it's very amazing. In verse 28, uh, Daniel is about to give him the interpretation, but then he says, but there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days, your dream and the visions of On your head, upon your bed, were these. As for you, O king, thoughts came to your mind while on your bed about what would come to pass after this. And he who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. And so, very significant. He's telling you, you were thinking about what's going to happen after this. Of course, Nebuchadnezzar came into power very quickly. His father passed away. Now he's the king. And all of a sudden, he's the, most, he's the king of the most powerful empire in the whole known world at the time. Of course, when we say he's a, a world ruler, there are other tribes and, and, and you know, places as people are exploring and, and starting to get away from this part of the world uh, that are not under his control. But the known world, the people that are living in cities and have some kind of governments going on, Uh, that are in this known part of the world that has been explored is what we're talking about here. And so that's where the the bulk of the people were. And so Nebuchadnezzar is in charge of this kingdom. And so he's laying there thinking about, well, how long is this going to go on? Is it going to get any better? Am I going to become more powerful? You know, what's going on? He's just thinking about the future. And often we do the same things as we're contemplating where we're at in our own lives. Uh, How long will this continue And so again, this prophecy, some call it the ABCs of prophecy. This is the very foundational, the great key to understanding. Uh, One commentator says it it pictures history through four successive Gentile empires continuing into the last days and pictures the rise of Christ's millennial kingdom. And that's a very important key that we need to look at tonight. As we're looking at the ABCs of prophecy, I'm going to assume that None of you have a clue about prophetic things. I know some of you do. I know some of you are very mature in the faith. But I don't want to just skip right out there and and assume that you guys know what I'm talking about when I say the millennial kingdom. How many knows what the millennial kingdom is all about? Don't be shy. See, there are some that know. There are some that don't know. And so I want to just begin with that very basic foundational understanding of prophetic things. If you do know this stuff, then this would be a good review for you because it is good to review. And so when do we find out about Christ's millennial kingdom or his millennial reign? Well, if you can hold your place there, go back to Revelation chapter 20, verse 2 through 4. Revelation chapter 20, last book in the New Testament. In Revelation... Chapter 20, verse 2, we'll just start with 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit. Now, this all takes place right as my nose is starting to run again. 
<laughs> all right. This is great. This all takes place after the tribulation period. And we'll talk more about that as we go through the book of Daniel. But an understanding of, of the end of, of the church age, as the church is raptured out of the earth, and then the great tribulation period starts, that seven-year period in which the Antichrist is ruling as the world empire on the earth. And people get the mark on their forehead and all that. You guys have probably heard something about that before. Well, this takes place even after that. Even after that. Uh, the key, an angel comes down with a key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. Okay, so there's your first key. A thousand years, the devil is bound in the bottomless pit. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. And I saw thrones and they, they sat on them and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw, <coughs> and I saw thrones and they sat on them and a judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. And so that's where we get the idea of the millennial reign of Christ. When does that take place? Um, It takes place after the the seven-year tribulation period. Well... There are three kind of prophetic interpretation models of this that you need to understand because every prophecy of Scripture that is looked at is looked at from that perspective, that worldview perspective. The first one being the amillennial idea. (coughs) The amillennial, there is no thousand year period. It was just kind of a symbolic way of looking at it. I'll take that. Thank you. (laughs) There is no real thousand year period. It was just kind of a symbolic thing. You know, you look at the book of Revelation, it's all symbolic. And uh, the Catholic Church and the Reformed theology churches kind of go with that model that there really is no thousand year uh, period of time, literal thousand year period of time where Christ is reigning with the church on the earth. And so they don't go into pre- or post-tribulation period. All right, well, the next one that you look at is the post-millennial, which is basically they're saying it's already happened or that somehow we're living in it now. And, uh, you know, this became very popular after the the waning of the the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, The Reformation period happened. And uh, the Dark Ages was over, the Age of Enlightenment had come, and it seemed like things were going to get better and better and better and better. And so they started coming up with this idea that maybe the Tribulation period was that time that the Holy Roman Empire was killing all the saints, and, and you can get the idea where that came from. But as the world wars, World War I, World War II, Vietnam, and, and all these other wars have come and, and more people have died than ever before in human history and more atrocities have been committed. That really has gone out the window and, and people really don't hold to that idea anymore. Um, and so the premillennial idea, especially after the establishment of the nation of Israel, which really filled in a lot of the blanks, um, that, that post-millennial view that they looked at before, well, they said, well, it must be symbolic that the nation of Israel is going to come back together and there'll be a nation again in Israel. Uh, that really has to be a symbolic thing. That couldn't happen. Surely that couldn't happen. So we'll have to, we'll have to look at these other prophecies and, and fill in the blanks somehow. And that was one of the ways of doing it. Well, as Israel started to become a nation again and eventually became a nation again, it became very clear that this is literal, literally happening, exactly as the Bible had said it was going to happen. And so now a more literal view of biblical scripture has come into the church. 
where we, we don't spiritualize that stuff anymore. We don't make it symbolic because God has shown us through his word that he, he makes it happen. And he has made it happen on numerous occasions. And so we could trust it in a literal sense. And so now the church really, on the whole, almost, I would say, uh, the evangelical church, I guess I would say, the fundamentalists, uh, we believe in a premillennial uh, view that the church will be raptured and then that seven-year tribulation period will happen and then we'll usher in that, that uh, thousand years of Christ's reign on the earth where Satan will be bound. And so that is the perspective that we come from at Calvary Chapel. If you're a post-millennialist, you're, you're going to be bummed out, I guess. But that's where we're coming from. We do believe that uh, there is a literal thousand-year reign of Christ that's going to happen after he returns to the earth. And so that's the way we're going to look at that. And so that really brings into perspective, as you go ahead and flip on on back over to uh, Daniel, (coughs) why this prophecy is being given now. Why is the prophecy being given at this point? And there's a very specific reason Uh, why did God wait until the nation of Israel had been broken into two separate groups, the northern kingdom being disbanded into the Assyrian areas, and then the the smaller southern nation of Judah being taken into captivity? Why didn't God talk about that stuff in Isaiah and in the other prophets that this was going to happen? Uh, Well, it's very significant because the kingdom of God was going to be set up on the earth. God was setting it up through his, his nation, the nation of Israel. He had established there uh, a temple in which his spirit was dwelling. All of the figures of heaven, they're in the throne room or in that place. And so God said, I'm going to be your God. I'm going to be your king. And he really expected the nation of Israel to carry on these, these things that he had set up and then eventually the Messiah would come through them and then they would establish this, the, the entire earth would be under the control of the Messiah there within the kingdom. Well, of course, God knew that the things that were going to happen would happen, but he had set it up in that way. And so now that the nation has fallen, now that the nation has completely uh, been disbanded and uh, they are sold into captivity, the nation of Israel will never again be sovereign until that millennial kingdom that I just talked about. And so from the point that the nation, the nation of Judah was taken into captivity in 606 BC until the point in which Christ returns in his second return is a time that we know as the time of the Gentiles, the times of the Gen- Gentiles. And so That's an important uh, thing to talk about here. Jesus talked about it a little bit. When he was talking about the end times, when he was talking about the tribulation and just all the things that are going to be going on, he talked about it. He said, These are the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days, for there will be a great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. He goes on. And they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations, which they have. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. The times of the Gentiles. Now, again, as we look at this dream tonight, there's a key figure involved in this dream. And it's a great image of a man. And we've talked about it before a little bit with a golden head and silver chest bronze on the waist, and iron legs, iron and clay feet. This is the symbol that Nebuchadnezzar sees in his dreams. And it is really, uh, it's very confusing, obviously. And so as people have tried to put all of these time sequences in line and make them all line up so you can understand it on a chronological scale, it becomes very difficult. And you see different charts like this come out. And people try to draw it out, and and it gets so confusing that you can't understand it. But the main figure that you can understand is from the point that the nation of Judah was taken into captivity until the return of Jesus Christ to the earth to establish his throne and his kingdom on the earth. 
is the time of the Gentiles. And so that becomes the key linchpin. That becomes the, the uh, I don't know, the keystone or whatever you want to call it, a frame of reference that you can go from. And you can look at all the other prophecies within the Bible that are yet to be fulfilled, and you can, you can place them in that time frame of the, the um, times of the Gentiles. A time in which the Gentile nations will be ruling the earth. Not the kingdom of God as set up through the nation of Israel, but a time in which Gentiles will rule the, rule the earth. And right in the middle of that time frame is when Jesus came in the middle of the Roman kingdom, the fourth kingdom that is on. I didn't want you to try to understand that entire graphic there, but just to give you that idea, it is very confusing because there's so much there. And you can get yourself all mixed up, but if you come back to this one frame of reference point and look at everything else in accordance with the, the dream that we're looking at here and, and the book of Daniel in general, the book of Daniel lays out what's going to happen for the next 2,600 years. And it gives you an idea. It even tells you when the Messiah is going to die. It gives you one of the, the clearest indications that Jesus, the Messiah, would not only come, but he would be rejected and he would be killed. And so, very, um, very incredible. And so, going back and looking at this, it is an exciting study. But what it does to King Nebuchadnezzar is it troubles him. Because he sees this great statue before him. He gets troubled and he calls his magicians in. And uh, he says, all right, I want you guys to tell me the dream. He says to them, calls the Chaldeans in. So they came and stood before the king. And the king said to them, I have had a dream and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic. O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will give the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, My decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me and its interpretation, you shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made an ash heap. However, if you tell the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts, rewards, and great honor. Therefore, tell me the dream and its interpretation. And they answered and said, let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will give its interpretation. So you see this thing going on. Okay, let's stop there for just a second and take a look at these magicians, these astrologers, the Chaldeans that are coming in here. Well, we know from the book, uh, well, all the gospel accounts, most of the gospel accounts actually have, uh, Matthew and Luke anyway, talk about these wise men coming from the east, right? They want to come and they want to see the king who is born. And they've said that we've followed his star. It says there in Matthew 2, 1 through 2, wise men came from the east. Uh, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. And so you ask, well, how did they know? How did they know that uh, there was a star that was going to lead him to the king. Well, I like to think that Daniel and his buddies told these guys that they're working with here, these magicians, these wise men, these astrologers, told them the whole story of, 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 of the gospel up to that point, of what they knew. And, and I think they told them that there's a Messiah coming and that these guys were still waiting. So now here we are 600 years later, when the wise men come from the east and they're looking for this Messiah, I think it was because, and this is just my own personal opinion, I think it was because of Daniel and his buddies. They were sharing with them what the, uh, what the Hebrew prophets had told them. But anyway, just to give you the idea, uh, that's who we're talking about here. These same kind of guys, magicians coming. Uh, in the Greek, magos or a magi or oriental scientist, a magician basically, a sorcerer, wise men. And so... These are, these, are, these are the guys that the king is calling in. He's calling in his wise men. I want you to interpret this dream. Not only that, I want you to tell me what the dream is first. Because it was so significant to him, he didn't want them to, you know, just give him, oh, well, you know, live forever, king. You know, I, you know uh, that dream was about whatever. And just throw out some kind of flimsy idea of what the dream was. 
It was so significant in the heart of the king. It rattled him so much. He wanted to know really. And so the only way he could know for sure what the interpretation was, if they had really gotten an idea of what the dream itself was. And so as we're looking at this, uh, the idea of the magi coming over, were they just a bunch of charlatans? Well, they may have been at the time of Daniel, but it does seem to give us an indication that they had some clue that there was a star that would lead them to the king. And so, uh, of course, in that day, they often looked to the stars to try to interpret their future and try to uh, predict the future, the zodiac. And, and, of course, that whole thing got perverted. And so there is, a, there is a theory out there that the zodiac at one time, God had set the stars in such a way that you can understand a basic understanding of the gospel by looking at the stars themselves and they would give you an indication, looking at the lion and the virgin and, and all the other things. You could get some kind of glimpse of, of the gospel. Of course, later on it became perverted and was used for wrong purposes. All right, well, don't know for sure. There are a lot of people out there that, that hold to that, but I'm not dogmatic about it. I think what we have here, though, that's interesting is that there's a new king now. It, he's in his third year. And he's trying these guys. Do these guys really know how to tell the future? Are they really wise men? My dad kept them around, but can they really tell the future? Can they really tell me things that I need to know? Can they interpret this dream that I have? And so he's calling them on the carpet, middle of the night. Get up, let's go, come on. It's kind of the idea. And uh, he wants to try these guys and find out. And so they start shucking and jiving a little bit here. You know, well, come on, King, you know, you, you tell us, the, uh, tell us the, the dream and we'll give you the interpretation. And so it looks like that they're stalling for time just a little bit here. And so that's when he really gets on them and starts telling them, I'm going to cut you in pieces. They answered again in verse 7 and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream and we will give its interpretation. The king answered and said, I know for certain that you would gain time because you see that my decision is firm. You guys are just stalling. If you do not make known the dream to me, there is only one decree for you. For you have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the time has changed or the situation has changed is another way of putting that. You guys are just stalling until maybe I forget about it. Maybe I'll go to bed tonight and not remember it in the morning. You guys are just stalling for time here. But the king is serious. Therefore, tell me the dream and I shall know that you can give me its interpretation. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is, let's see. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, verse 10, There is not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. So they're, now they're being honest with him. Look, you know, we're, we're wise men, we're magicians, but really the thing you're asking is impossible. There's nobody that can give the kind of answer that you're asking for right now. They're being honest with him finally. Not a man on the earth who can tell the king's matter. Therefore, no king, lord, or ruler has ever asked such things of any magician, astrologer, astrologer or Chaldean. It is a difficult thing that the king requests, and there is no other who can tell it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. I thought that was very interesting. There's nobody else that can tell you except the gods who don't dwell here. They dwell in another place. And, you know, I think they've struck on a chord there. I think they've uh, struck on the truth there to a large degree. Man cannot tell you because they live here with us. It's only God that dwells in, in that other time domain that can tell you the answer. And, and so even though they believe in, in false gods, they really have given a, a true answer here. God the Father is truly the only one that can see the future. And we've talked a lot about this already in this study. He's the only one that can establish the future. He's really written it to a large degree. And he, he can see for the end from the beginning. And so... Again, looking at your own life, if you put that in the context of not just nations rising and falling and kings rising and falling and 2,600 years of human history, but in your own life, 
the thing I said at the beginning about the, the whole Bible being prophetic. The whole Bible is prophetic uh, because of these promises that God has made to each one of each one of us. You know, you look at a passage where it's just talking about your relationship with God or God's love or, you know, just a promise that he's given us. All of those things will be fulfilled. Just as sure as this dream of Nebuchadnezzar, uh, this statue and all the other stuff that we're looking at tonight, every promise that God has made to you individually, every promise he's made to me will be fulfilled. And that makes the whole Bible prophetic. Everything that he says in here is prophetic. And so... It's a powerful way of looking at that. Uh, Jesus gives us that indication as well. He was telling them, uh, the Matthew 24, where he's talking about the tribulation period and all the things that are going to happen in the end times. And then he goes into that idea of saying, you know, but that day and the hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. My Father knows. He has all these things in his hand. He could tell the future and no one else can. And so it's a difficult thing for men. In fact, it's an impossible thing for men. But with God, all things are possible. All right. Well, going on there in verse 12. For this reason, the king was angry and furious and gave the command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree went out and they began killing the wise men and sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Then with the counsel and wisdom, Daniel answered Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, Why is the decree from the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the decision known to Daniel. So again, you see that favor that God has given Daniel with his captors. So Daniel went in and asked the king to give him time that he might tell the king the interpretation. And so we see here what history has backed up is that this is, you know, you might get an indication as you read through the book of Daniel that King Nebuchadnezzar was a nice guy, that he was really just a pretty good guy, you know, kind of a father figure to Daniel maybe. And, but history tells us a very different story. History tells us that the king was capricious, he was ruthless, he was a despotic ruler with, <laughs> thank you very much, with absolute power. He was the most powerful ruler that the world had ever known. And if he said, off with their heads, they chopped your heads off. And you see it right here. Uh, he says, I'm killing all of you. All of the wise men, all the astrologers, you're dead. And he starts having them killed. And they're being killed. And then Daniel steps forward and says, hold on, why is this so urgent? Why does this have to happen tonight? Give me a little bit of time and then I'll come back and I'll, I'll try to give an interpretation for the king. And so again, we see that favor. And, and we looked at chapter 1, uh, Daniel, in all matters of wisdom and understanding, the king examined him, he found him 10 times better. And so with that word, evidently, the, the king said, oh, Daniel's working on this? Okay, I'll hold off for a little while. Perhaps is what had happened. We don't know for sure. But it would seem that they're going to give him that time. Thank you very much. All right. <laughs> Can I get a chair maybe? <laughs> awesome. But he was a very ruthless uh, ruler. An indication of that we find uh, later on. Remember I told you there were successive uh, sieges of Judah. The final, one of the final ones, I think it was the final one, where the king that was there left in Judah had uh, crossed Nebuchadnezzar. And so Nebuchadnezzar has him brought to him. They kill his sons. Well, let's just read it. Second Kings 25, 6. They took the king and brought him up to the king of Babylon. Goes on for a little bit there. They killed the sons of uh, King Zedekiah before his eyes, put out the eyes of Zedekiah, bound him with bronze fetters, and took him to Babylon. And so... The last thing he sees with his eyes are his sons being killed. And that was something that they, they did uh, quite, quite uh, regularly. Uh, they would kill your sons and your family and everybody you knew and loved, and then they'd put your eyes out. So the last thing that you ever saw was that horrible scene uh, of that happening. And so that was King Nebuchadnezzar that did that. And so that gives you an indication. He's, he's not, at this point, an overly nice guy.
Well, Daniel knows that, and he says, we got to have a prayer meeting. So he goes back to his buddies, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then Daniel went to his house and made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions. Those are the Hebrew names for the boys. Uh, that they might seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning this secret. So Daniel, so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men in Bab- of Babylon. Let's try that again, get it on the tape. So a cry for mercy. <clears throat> Dan goes back and he he prays with the guys. Let's seek the Lord on this thing. Let's find out what he says. Let's get an interpretation from him. And of course, that's the right direction to go. When you're faced with a a situation like this, what do you do? Do you moan? Do you cry? Do you say this is unfair? Do you go consult other people? Or do you cry out to the Lord? Do you ask the Lord, you know, what should we do here? Give us an answer. A cry for mercy. Mercy. Let's go seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning this secret, and he will give us an answer. And that's exactly what they did, and God did meet them at that place. And it reminds us of what James says. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails a little bit sometimes, doesn't it? No, it it avails much. You know, there's one incident that happened to my wife and I when my daughter Alyssa was being born. Um... I, I got there to the hospital and labor was, was pretty far into the process, you know, and uh, they came to a point where they said, well, the baby's turned the wrong way. We might have to do a cesarean. And me, you know, the dumb guy, oh, okay, that's cool. And I happened to look over at my wife. She's like, no, you know, she gave me this look like, no way. I don't want a cesarean, you know, and, uh, and it was just such a look that, it, okay, you know, and. For, for some reason, I'm not a spiritual guy, but I ran in the, the bathroom and I, man, I got on my knees and it was the most fervent prayer I'd ever prayed in my life. Lord God, you know, I mean, I really just, I, I just sensed the urgency in my wife's face and I saw that she was really, uh, she didn't want to go through that. And so I, I prayed and, uh, you know, not bragging on myself or anything, but I came back out and the doctor said, oh no, the baby slipped, we're good. We don't have to do that. And man, I mean, you could say that's a coincidence, but I just felt that, man, the Lord answered that prayer. The Lord met us at that place, and uh, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So what do you do in those situations? Well, you get on your knees and pray. Ask the Lord to get you out of that situation. Ask the Lord what his will is in that situation, and you never know. All right, well... The secret was revealed in verse 19. Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. So Daniel blessed the Lord, blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever. For wisdom and might are his, and he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him. I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and might and have now made known to me what we asked of you. For you have made known to us the king's demand. And so there you see it. Prayer, praise, and thanksgiving. What does God want from us after he answers our prayer? A little bit of praise, a little bit of thanksgiving, that's all. That's all he asks for. You know, it's no big thing. How often, though, do you, are you praying that fervent prayer? Oh, God, you've got to make this happen in my life. And then it happens, and you're like, all right, cool. And then it'll be a day or two sometimes before I realize, man, that thing I've been praying about for all that time, God worked it all out and I haven't even thanked him yet for that thing that I've been praying for. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's, it's just a good pattern there that, that Daniel's showing us. In a crisis situation, you go to the Lord, you pray, you pray a fervent prayer. And then when he comes through for you, 
you thank him for it. You give him praise. You give him honor because he is awesome, because he has done that great and mighty work in your life. And you see the things that Daniel says here. And it must have been an incredible thing for Daniel. This is the first time he's had one of these interpretations uh, on this scale for sure. He might have had something in the past. But on this scale, I mean, this vision that we're going to look at, uh, Daniel gets not only what the interpretation is, but he finds out what the dream is itself. And it's an awesome dream. You see this image and, and a stone comes and hits the image and it falls apart. And what's it all about? Well, these are the next four nations of the, of the, of the Gentile world for the next you know, hundred, <clears throat> several hundred years down the road. That was a good one, Terry. He's up there on that volume knob. He's ready. In verse 24, through the end of the chapter there, and we'll wrap it up. Revealer of secrets. Therefore Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Take me before the king, and I will tell the king the interpretation. And then Arioch quickly brought Daniel before the king and said thus to him, Hey, I found the guy. I found the guy. He can... Taking a little credit for himself, right? He says, I have found a man of the captives of Judah who will make known to the king the interpretation. The king answered and said to Daniel whose name was Belteshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, the secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets and he has made known to the king to King Nebuchadnezzar, what will be in the latter days, your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed were these. Daniel is not going to take any credit for himself here is the main thing that we need to see. Daniel has the dream. He has the interpretation. Here he's standing in front of all these other magicians and sorcerers who don't have a clue. He has the answers, and, and certainly he could set himself up here, couldn't he? I mean, he could set himself up royally to give this interpretation. He's already in a pretty good spot, and, uh, but he doesn't take any of that for himself. He says, all the other guys, they couldn't tell you, they couldn't declare to the king what the answer was, but there's a God in heaven. There's a God in heaven that can. He knows what you were thinking about before you went to bed the other night or tonight, and he is the revealer of secrets, not me. It's not me. I'm not the guy that gives you the answer. God's just going to use me as a vessel. As for you, verse 29. As for you, O king, thoughts came to your mind while on your bed about what would come to pass after this. And he who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. But as for me, this secret has not been revealed to me because I have more wisdom than anyone living. But for our sakes, who make known the interpretation to the king, and that you may know the thoughts of your of your heart. And so again, he doesn't take any of the credit to himself. He gives all of it to the Lord. An awesome example for each one of us. And really, I was thinking about I talked about this a little bit on Saturday morning. We've been looking at this as we've been going through the book of John on uh, the home fellowships. I hope the home fellowships have been talking about this anyway. We know one did. Um, being a light bearer, we are here to bear the light that God has given us. We are reflectors of that light. We are not the light ourselves. And so I was thinking about that in the light of, you know, that old uh, adage about the moon. You know, the moon is not a light itself. It is a reflector of the sun. The moon itself is dead. There's, there's nothing living on it. It's a dead rock, just a dusty old globe there hanging in the sky. It has no power source. It has no electricity. It has no way of giving its own light. It is there to reflect the light of the sun, and that's it. 
And we can look at our own lives in the same way, that we are light bearers. We are here to reflect the light that is coming from the Lord Jesus himself. From whatever light is coming through our own lives, it should be reflecting out. Because if it's not, if we're trying to bring that glory to ourselves, and now you can look at it in the way of the moon blocking the sun, what's that called? <laughs> An eclipse. When we're trying to get our, our glory in there, what are we doing? We're, we're eclipsing the Lord. We're blocking all that light that he's wanting to shed onto other people and trying to bring the light to ourselves. When sure, we're lit up, but the rest of the world is in darkness as a result of our selfishness. So what do we find John the Baptist saying in, in that? You know, in uh, the first chapter of John there, we see this man, speaking of John the Baptist, came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man. A light bearer, bearing witness to the light. And that's what we are. We are to bear witness of that light as well, to reflect. John himself said, I must decrease and he must increase. His disciples came and said, hey, all of our disciples are leaving you and now they're going over to Jesus. And John said, that's right. And that's the way it should be. He must, I must decrease. He must increase. It's now time to start shining the light to him. And uh, that is is exactly what we are to do. And so that's what Daniel is doing as well. God has given me this gift. He's given me this dream. He's given me this interpretation, but give it all to him right back to him. He's the God that reveals secrets, not me. And so, awesome. Daniel, looking now at the great image itself in verse 31. You, O king, were watching and behold a great image. This great image whose splendor was excellent stood before you and its form was awesome. We're not going to go in great detail on the image here tonight. Obviously, we're almost done. Uh, I just wanted to cover this part of it, and then next week we'll go into the actual interpretation. So this great image, it's a, it says awesome. The old King James says terrible or uh, terrifying. It gives you that idea. It's, um, but our, our common term that we'd use today is awesome. But it does give you the idea it was so big and, and uh, incredible looking that it was fearful, that the king had a fear just of seeing this gigantic thing standing before him. It was a fearful thing to behold. It was an awesome thing to behold, a terrible thing to behold. And we get the idea it was very bright. Obviously, the metals, the gold and the silver and the bronze and everything was uh, lit up, perhaps. And, uh, And so he's watching this great image. It stood before him. And then it goes into talking about the image itself. But before we get into that, Today, again, as I was preparing, there was a point where I just, you know, I I got to this point of, okay, now I got to talk about the image, you know, and it, because it is such an important part of Bible prophecy, I mean, uh, just getting a good handle on this, you know, uh, I was, I was just very timid about it, you know, just trying to go through there and describe this great image and, and, uh, and do a a good job. You know, I want to rightly divide the word of God and, and bring it to you guys in a way that you can understand. And, uh, it is an awesome prophecy in the Bible to talk about this great image. But I decided I'd been working at my desk for quite a while. And I said, I'm going to go get a drink of water and come back and just worship the Lord for a little while. And, and so I hit play on my iPod again. And the next song was how great thou art. And as I was walking out the door, just something caught me. And I went back and I listened to that. And, you know, we could talk about how great man, man's kingdoms are. And this, this image really is, is the epitome of that. The epitome of man's great kingdoms of the earth. All of the things that man has been able to accomplish over the 6,000 years of man's history, you know. And, and we do stand in awe. We're terrified and, and we see the awesomeness of what man has created. But in comparison to who God is and what he has created and how awesome and terrifying he is, I mean, it's really no comparison, no comparison at all. And so I just sat there and listened to that song with that idea in mind. Yeah, I'm going to talk about this image, but it's really nothing. 
It's nothing in comparison with God. That song is great. O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made. Man has made buildings. Man has made cars and and airplanes. But the worlds that God has created, the universe that God has created, possibly universe is. I mean, it's amazing to think of what God has created if you just stop and consider it. I see the stars. I hear the rolling thunder. Thy power throughout the universe displayed. And then, of course, the chorus. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art. How great thou art. Man has created great kingdoms, but they don't stand anywhere near what, how great God is. And that is really the emphasis of this, this whole story, this whole dream. Man creates this, this image. Man creates this kingdom or series of kingdoms, and God just smashes them. And they all fall, and they get ground to powder, and they just blow away like the threshing floor, and they're never seen again. They're never seen again. And that's what this whole thing is about. It's what man's glory is about. First Peter one twenty four: All flesh is grass, is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers and the, its flowers falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And that is absolutely the truth. This image is going to fall. It's great. It's mighty. It's awesome. As as Nebuchadnezzar beholds it. But then a stone comes and smacks it at its feet and it falls over. It crushes and blows away, just like the grass withering and fading. And so that image, in the last couple of verses here, verse 32, this image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So you can see the, uh, I don't know if you can read that or not, but um, we're going to look at this and and we'll go in great detail about uh, the kingdoms, the successive kingdoms that each one of the parts of the body represents there. But you can see the time uh, scales there. I don't want to go into that. But one thing that we do need to understand just looking at this here tonight, the fine gold head at the top, Daniel will go on to describe that that is Babylon. That is Babylon. It is the, uh, the pure, powerful kingdom. It, it is an absolute authority figure, and so it's represented in gold. But as we go down the body, you'll notice that there's a diminishing of value of precious material there and a diminishing of the weight of that material. Increase in the strength but not necessarily in the power. The nations get stronger as as new weapons come about. Um, And and by the time you get to Rome, of course, Rome just goes across the the face of the earth and smashes everybody um, because of their weapons. But their power is not absolute. Their power is not absolute like uh, Babylon's, like Nebuchadnezzar's. Uh, They have now democracy. By the point you get to Rome, Democracy has taken over and the absolute power has gone out the window. And so there's an interesting dichotomy there with the diminishing value and weight, but an increase in strength, but not in absolute power. Um, It's interesting. This thing is top heavy and has a severely weak foundation, such as the, the kingdoms of men. Very top heavy, looks great on the top, you know, outwardly it has this very fine look to it, a look of power. But if you look a little bit closer, down at the bottom, feet of clay. Ceramic is what is being spoken about there. I think I put, yeah, ceramic feet. It's not, it's not like soft clay that you dig up somewhere. It's uh, clay that has already gone through a furnace. And it's, so it's ceramic. And so you can see 
how this thing would crumble if a, a large stone was thrown at those ceramic feet. I mean, this thing is extremely top-heavy, and the foundation is, is very weak. So it's very interesting as we look at who Jesus is, who he is spoken about in the New Testament. He is referred to as being a stone. He is referred to being a, a cornerstone. And so the foundation of man's kingdoms is uh, ceramic. Ceramic mixed with a little bit of strength. But the stone, who is Jesus, we'll look at that a little bit later on, the cornerstone, the, the, what should be used as a foundation for all the nations, what should have been the foundation for the world, is, is the thing that will eventually crush the kingdoms of men. And of course, when Jesus returns in the second coming, that's what we see, is him crushing those nations. All right. Well, again, we see that in Luke chapter 20. Uh, Verse 17, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. It's interesting. It's it's a top-heavy figure. The gold is at the top. Where should the gold be? The heaviest material. Well, the the kingdom of heaven, we see. The streets are paved with gold, right? It's interesting. The chief cornerstone should have been used to lay that foundation. And so again, I've I've quoted this verse many times, but whoever falls on that stone, whoever falls on Jesus will be broken, broken in spirit. Uh, Their will will be broken. They should be broken. Uh, Their pride and arrogance should be broken. And, And so we come to him and we want to fall on him. We want to have our lives broken upon that stone. But whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. And so... I've given you just kind of a preview of the dream itself. Again, we'll look at the interpretation of it next week.